Okay, come here. I think it's about time we had a heart to heart about what you should never, and I mean never ever, do in Disney World. Trust me. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog, and you're in that honeymoon phase of your trip, i.e. you've just got everything booked and you're getting starry-eyed about how perfect this vacation is going to be, and this is when your defenses are down and easy mistakes can slip through the cracks. Maybe you forget to pack something crucial, or you forget to study up on how things work differently around Disney nowadays, or you forget that, hey oh, no Disney vacation is going to be 100% perfect, no matter how much you want it to be. But that's why you clicked on this video, right? Because you want to nip any potential mistakes in the bud before you make them. And you know what? Good for you. We're going to help you do just that. In fact, you get a reward for that. I've got a free gift for you today before we get started. Go ahead and scan the QR code you see on the screen now or head over to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney Plans. You'll get our free Disney planning worksheets. We made up these organized digital pages to help you keep track of your Disney reservations, your daily schedules, your packing lists, and more. See, you're already on the path to success. All right, now it's time to get into the meat of things. Never ever leave the park when everyone else does. At the end of the day, Disney World crowds are straight out of your nightmares. Many guests stay in the parks until the very end of the day, meaning crowds for the buses as well as that thick stream of people just trying to get out of the park is going to be intense. But the worst end of night crowds happen at Magic Kingdom. While you probably want to stay for Happily Ever After because it's beautiful and magical and all that other good stuff, the rush of people exiting the park after the show shoots off that last firework is is overwhelming. All those guests are ready to get back to their hotel rooms ASAP. They've got cranky kids. They've eaten too much sugar all day and they feel gross. They just want to get home. They are tired. Their feet hurt. Even if you drove to the park and are skipping over the resort bus line, you're still going to have to take that monorail or ferry boat to get to the parking lot. And the lines are interminable. The moral, there's no escaping these crowds. Don't want to deal with the transportation crowds? Me either. The stores on Main Street USA stay open for 30 minutes after the park closes, but these shops will still be packed with people trying to do any last minute souvenir shopping. So if you really want to avoid the frenzy and you're not in a big hurry to get back to your hotel room just yet, head toward the back of the park to wait things out. Things may be closing up for the night back there, but you should still find some open seating where you'll be able to take a breather before heading back up to the front of the park. And if you're really smart, you can squeeze one more ride in. You may actually be able to get in line for a last minute ride before the park officially closes. So for example, if the park closes is at 9 p.m. you can normally get in line for Peter Pan's flight at 8.59 before the queue closes off. If you are trying to leave the park right after it closes, just like everyone else, keep in mind that a rideshare service that isn't Disney's personal minivan service isn't necessarily going to be a shortcut for you. Rideshares like Uber or Lyft still pick up guests at the Transportation and Ticket Center, not at the front gates of Magic Kingdom, meaning you're still going to have to take that ferry or monorail to reach it. And since there could be several guests ordering a rideshare all at once, availability could vary depending on demand. I often have a very, very hard time getting a rideshare right when Magic Kingdom is closing and an extra hard time getting a minivan. One last note for you, be sure to stay aware of when Disney's transportation wraps up for the night because it isn't a 24 hour service. Disney buses and the monorail usually run for one hour after the park closes, while the resort launch boats from the park to Grand Floridian and Wilderness Lodge and other Disney hotels stop 45 minutes after the park is closed, so don't wait too long. Okay, this next one, Bria and I had to learn the hard way. Bria, of course, if you don't know, is our script writer, and she warned me before I went to Typhoon Lagoon that I needed to wear shoes. I said, you're wrong. They're not going to let me wear shoes around the water park, but that's not true. They do, and you should. The pavement at both Disney's Typhoon Lagoon and Disney's Blizzard Beach, whichever one is open, is going to be painful for your poor bare feet, especially if you spend a whole day there. Not only is it hot during the day, making you do that comedic hot, 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 hot chant while you jump around like microwave popcorn until you get back in the water, but the pavement also has these little crater-like holes in it that can cut up and blister the soles of your feet. Really, I did not believe her, but she is right. And by the end of the day, my feet were absolutely destroyed. Now, I will say they have these super cool little like water spigots, like little sprinklers that keep the pavement wet all day. 
in most places, but still your feet are going to be ripped up and destroyed. I don't understand why other people aren't talking about this because it was really, really horrible. So just make sure you're not kicking off your footwear prematurely if you're planning on walking from place to place around the parks. I'd recommend investing in a sturdy pair of water shoes since those will be allowed on the water rides. And honestly, I wore my plastic Birkenstocks on the water rides and nobody said a thing. So, you know, you might get away with that too. So your mileage may vary, but I do recommend some sort of water water shoes for those water rides. Next thing to never ever do in Disney World is not check on those park closures. You've probably heard me talk about closures in the past and you're going to hear me talk about closures again in the future because Disney World closures are a very common thing and nobody's expecting them and they catch people off guard all the time. So let's talk about the most recent closures that could threaten to derail your trip if you're getting yourself all hyped up to experience them while they're down for the count. First, Tiana's Bayou Adventure. Splash Mountain closed on January 23rd, 2023, kicking off its major Princess and the Frog transformation. So brace yourself for Tiana's Bayou Adventure, set to open later on in 2024. Because we're looking at a late 2024 opening here, although Disney did change their language. Now they're just saying 2024, so maybe it'll be mid-year. I don't know. Fingers crossed. But it's very possible that your upcoming trip will still greet you with a whole lot of construction over in Magic Kingdom's Frontierland. That being said, we will be watching for more updates on Tiana's opening timeline, so you'll never have to feel out of the loop. Now, if you miss Splash Mountain or want to celebrate the new ride, because new stuff is exciting stuff, be sure to check out our DFB t-shirts over on dfbstore.com. We've got a Splash Mountain farewell tour shirt and a tea on a tea as well. Or you can buy one of each to show your mixed feelings towards one ride going away and a new ride taking its place. Whatever works for you. Now, Voyage of the Little Mermaid. This is over in Hollywood Studios and it's been down for the count since the 2020 closures, but Disney just recently announced that it's not coming back except it kind of is. You know how Finding Nemo the Musical and Animal Kingdom transformed into Finding Nemo the Big Blue and Beyond? We're getting the same kind of treatment for The Little Mermaid. So instead of being Voyage of The Little Mermaid, it's gonna be replaced with a new show called Little Mermaid, A Musical Adventure, coming to Disney's Hollywood Studios this fall. This is gonna be a fully reimagined theatrical production inspired by the Walt Disney Animation Studios classic of the same name. So it's basically gonna be the same sort of puppet show live entertainment situation with like a new song. Now we're pretty used to this show being closed by now, but if you're excited to see the new one, one, then you may want to wait to take your big Disney trip until the fall or winter. I know Rock and Roller Coaster over in Hollywood Studios already had a lengthy refurbishment just this past year, but it went back into refurb mode this year, yet again, starting on January 8th. That ride has been struggling for a long time. Disney expects this closure to last for several months and is anticipating it to reopen sometime in the summer of 2024. So yeah, Rock and Roller Coaster has had a rough past couple of years, but if you want to welcome it back when it's up and feeling better again, then you may want to hold off on your trip until the second half of the year. And then of course there's Country Bear Jamboree in Magic Kingdom, which is getting ready to close for a very, very, very long time. On January 27th, 2024, the OG Country Bear Show will say so long, partner, and enter into a lengthy refurbishment that last until this summer. These updates are going to be inspired by the Opry-style shows of Nashville, Tennessee. In fact, Nashville musicians are helping out with the arrangements to make it as authentic and rockabilly as possible. Alas, it'll be sad to see this furry gang closing their doors for months, especially since Frontierland's already got construction going on over at Tiana's Bayou Adventure, so it's really going to be a mess over there for a good chunk of the year. This is only a sliver of the Disney closings that are gonna be impacting the parks this year. That doesn't even begin to touch the different hotel closures that you're gonna see popping up around the bubble too, the pool closures, the transportation closures. Now you can check for these closures ahead of your trip by visiting the Disney World website and checking for those orange warnings listed toward the top of each attraction and resort's main page. If you don't see any orange warnings, you're probably in the clear for now, but it still never hurts to keep checking back to make sure the opening status for the thing you're looking forward to doesn't suddenly switch up on you. Next thing you should never do in Disney World, think that things are gonna be the same as they were before. If you went to Disney World last year or the year before that, or even if you've never been, but you've watched some of our past videos and you think you got the gist of things, 2024 is gonna throw a wrench in your plans. First off, Disney recently got rid of the park pass reservation requirement for date-based tickets. However, annual pass holders will still usually need a park pass in order to get inside the theme parks. The exceptions to that rule are after 2 p.m. on most days, excluding Magic Kingdom 
themed them on Saturdays and Sundays, as well as good to go days. Good to go days, you don't need a park pass reservation. Now, the good to go days will show up on the annual pass holder calendar, so you can plan when you want to visit and see whether you'll need a park pass on those specific days or not. The problem with this system, you can't really plan too far ahead. Disney stated that they'll update the calendar with more good to go days, days or weeks in advance, so they're not really giving us a ton of heads up. So to be on the safe side of things, we recommend making a park pass reservation for your trip no matter what. Then if those dates become good to go days later on, Disney will automatically remove the park pass that you no longer need. That way you can use it for a different trip instead. To view these good to go days on the My Disney Experience app, just go to the home page, tap on the little plus button at the bottom middle of your screen, then tap on the make or modify park reservations option. From there, choose the annual passes option under view current availability, and then you have to select your pass type and the park you want to visit to see which dates are good to go. Yeah, it's a little chaotic right now for sure, but we'll let you know if Disney updates this system in the future. Disney Genie Plus, aka Disney World's premium line bypassing service, might be changing very soon in a major way. Aside from the price, one of the biggest complaints guests have had about Genie Plus since its launch back in 2021 has been the amount of time you have to spend on your phone scheduling lightning lanes during your actual park day, something that's very different from how the former free FastPass Plus service used to work, which allowed you to book fast passes before your trip. Right, now you have to buy Disney Genie Plus and book your lightning lanes on the day of your visit. Visit. But in May 2023, Disney announced that it plans to make changes to this service in 2024 so that guests can select lightning lanes before their park visit once again. It's important to note, though, that Disney still hasn't revealed when they're planning to implement this change or what the exact details are going to include. For instance, with FastPass Plus, you could make some of your plans ahead of your trip, reserving up to three fast passes then, but any other fast passes you wanted to make had to be done the day of your visit after you'd already used up your pre-selected ones. So that could also be the case with this anticipated Genie Plus change, or it could be completely different, because who knows? Because this is what Disney likes to do to us. <laughs> but for now, Genie Plus is still a day of situation, so make sure to check out our Genie Plus video playlist on our YouTube site for advice on how to handle lightning lanes as they are right now. And then we'll make new videos once those changes actually go live in the future, because that's what we do. Now, y'all know how I mentioned Tiana's Bayou Adventure would be opening up later this year. That means virtual queues will, yet again, be updated. I can 99.99999% guarantee you on that one. While Disney hasn't said officially whether or not Tiana's will use a virtual queue when it opens, if history repeats itself like it's been doing these past few years, then it's a really, really, really good candidate for getting one. Our big bad guess right now is that if Tiana's Bayou Adventure gets a virtual queue, then the virtual queue for Tron Light Cycle Run might go away, but we'll just have to wait a few more months to officially find out. Per the release of this video, both Tron and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind and Epcot still use the virtual queue system, which is the only way you'll be able to experience either ride unless you buy an individual lightning lane for it. I'll add a link to our virtual queue post from the DFB website down in the description for you in case you want to study up on how these specifically work and how to improve your chance of getting one. And let's not forget all the new stuff happening on the Epcot scene. We've got a new area for festival programming called Communicore Hall and Plaza, a new world celebrations garden area, a new walkthrough attraction, Journey of Water inspired by Moana, a brand new nighttime fireworks show, Luminous, a new table service restaurant, Shiki Sai Sushi Izakaya, and even more newness coming in the future. So in short, the Epcot you knew before is not the Epcot you will meet soon. So study up and know which new things you want to prioritize for your future trip. One of them should definitely be seeing the light up glow sidewalks in Epcot World Celebration Gardens at night because they are truly incredible, especially if you're an 80s Epcot kid. And finally, we've got some more new restaurants that have recently opened over in Disney Springs, as well as a couple of new restaurants that Disney's Boardwalk Inn is going to open very, very soon. In Springs, you can now eat at Eat, an Indian inspired quick service featuring shareables and traditional items with a more modern twist. And for a new table service offering, Summer House on the Lake serves California-inspired bites, including options like pizza, pasta, fresh salad, sandwiches, and potato salad deviled eggs. Sorry, had to shout those eggs out specifically because they really blew us away. Summer House also features an attached cookie bar that you won't need reservations for. Yep, you can just walk right up to get your cookies, and they have a signature rosé cart. At Disney's Boardwalk Inn, we're getting ready for the grand opening of the Cake Bake Shop, which will be a sit-down restaurant dripping with tea party charm and plenty of 
of freshly baked goodies. And for an even faster, cheaper food option opening up in the near future, the Boardwalk Inn will also introduce us to its new blue ribbon corn dog stand. This, which originated out in Disneyland territory first, will serve hand-dipped corn dogs and other unique corn dog creations. While new quick services and kiosks won't need any advanced dining reservations, table service locations like the Cake Bake Shop and Summer House on the Lake will definitely take them and it will benefit you to have them. So be sure to book those ADRs as soon as you can, which will be 60 days before your visit. How about ignoring Florida's vehicular laws? Okay. I trust that y'all are good and abiding citizens out there, and let's keep it that way by following the state of Florida's key laws that'll help keep you safe and keep you from getting fined. While driving around Disney World, law number one, don't have an open container in your vehicle. In some states, having an open container of alcohol in your vehicle while operating it is legal, just as long as you're not drinking it, but in Florida, that's not the case. The law strictly forbids open containers of alcohol in your vehicle, which covers both the driver and passengers, whether you're stationary or on the road. While there are some exceptions to this rule, it's best not to look for the loopholes and just don't do it, period. Disney's pretty particular about taking alcoholic drinks outside of their parks too, as in you can't do it at all, even if you're just walking back over to your room and not getting behind the wheel at all. And this is why you'll oftentimes see guests chugging their Epcot drinks near the exits of the park so they don't end up wasting money for what they paid for. All in all, just be sure that if you're enjoying a drink or two during your Disney day, you're doing so responsibly and following all the rules. Okay, stay off your phone while driving. This probably isn't an unfamiliar law for you since most US states have laws regarding phones and driving, but Florida state laws are very strict when it comes to the use of your phone for texting while you're behind the wheel. In fact, Florida law prohibits you from using your phone in any type of distracting way, even if you're just trying to dial a phone number. If you need to type in a new destination into your phone's GPS, or you need to get a hold of someone in your travel group while you're driving, make sure to hand the role of keeper of the phone to one of your fellow passengers, use your hands free, or you'll need to pull over at your nearest gas station or parking lot to do any important messaging via your smart device. And turn on your headlights when it's raining. It rains all the time in Florida, so this rule pretty much applies all year round, almost every single day. Regardless of whether it's day or night, if it's raining, smoky, or foggy out, you'll need to turn those headlights on. And if you forget, well, you could end up being pulled over and ticketed. And no one wants that when they're already paying thousands for a Disney vacation. Oof, now here's something you may not be thinking about. Despite paying for a character dining buffet restaurant, you might accidentally miss a character meet and greet if y'all go to pick up your food at the exact wrong time. So do not have everybody in the family get up all at once at a character buffet. Characters come around one at a time to each table, but if your whole group decides to get up all at once to hit up the buffet line, a character might skip over your table altogether since there's no one there to visit with. How sad is that? Okay. So if this does happen, don't panic. There is an easy solution so you don't have to deal with the waterworks from your disappointed kids. If a character skips over your table because it was empty earlier, just tell your server or a cast member in a blue shirt what happened. They'll make sure you still get to meet the character before your meal wraps up. Also, you can sort of keep an eye on where the characters are in the restaurant and know if they're going to come up to your table soon. That is, unless you're the first table that a character comes to, in which case you won't be able to tell. But you can always ask your server before you kind of get up to go to the buffet and say, hey, is, you know, Grumpy going to be here imminently? <laughs> we've got park hopping rule changes, everybody. So now we've got some park hopping rules that we need to update. As of right now, all guests are once again free to park hop however they see fit. But just because you have that park hopping ability doesn't mean you need to go hog wild with it. Because if you wind up park hopping the wrong way, your day might turn into more of a traveling back and forth all day rather than actually having fun day. With that being said, here is DFB's preferred method of park hopping that'll help you conquer all four parks in one day as efficiently as possible, if that's your goal. Since Animal Kingdom typically opens earlier than the other parks, it makes a lot of sense to start your Disney day here if you're truly trying to maximize your time. Not only that, but with a lot of the animals here, most active during the morning hours, before the afternoon heat makes them all sluggish, which, you know, same, that's when you want to visit Animal Kingdom. From AK, you're going to want to hop on a bus and head to Hollywood Studios. In this scenario, I'd suggest purchasing Genie Plus for the day to fit in as many rides as possible. That way, while you're getting in line for the rides over at Animal Kingdom, you can be simultaneously selecting lightning lanes for some of Hollywood Studios A tier rides to up your multitasking game. You can stack those lightning lanes so you have a bunch to ride when you get to Hollywood Studios. 
After Hollywood Studios, you can take a super speedy ride aboard the Skyliner to hit up your third park, Epcot. The Skyliner's gonna drop you off at the International Gateway. That spits you out into World Showcase right between France and the UK Pavilion, meaning you're gonna be super close to Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. And lastly, hop aboard the Epcot monorail to hit up your fourth and final park of the day, Magic Kingdom, because this one does usually stay open a little bit later. And you can plan to arrive early enough to catch Happily Ever After if you're okay with battling those end of the night crowds, of course. Now, sometimes Epcot will stay open later than Magic Kingdom, especially during during those not so busy times of year. So definitely check park hours. It's easier to do just do the Skyliner from DHS to Epcot and then take the monorail to Magic Kingdom. But if you really need to hit up Magic Kingdom before Epcot because it closes first, then you can switch that around. But work smarter, not harder, everybody. Just look at those park hours and see how you can get the most in possible with your new park hopping freedom. Now, before you look at this park hopping play-by-play -play and go, yes, this is something I wanna do, heed this warning. If you're planning on driving, you're still gonna have to backtrack to the park you last left your car. So in this case, it may be easier for you to not rely on Disney transportation while using your park hopper and just drive yourself from place to place instead. If you're a hotel guest, parking will be free, but if you're staying off property, parking's gonna cost you $30 per day per vehicle. But that price will cover all the parks you hop to. Just show a parking lot cast member your receipt and they'll let you in. Next up, never, ever, ever buy those huge souvenirs at the beginning of the day. I've been there before too. I've seen that certain Disney World souvenir in the park I just had to have, and with no rational thought helping me sort right from wrong, I blacked out and swiped my card only to carry out an enormous bag and go, wait, I don't wanna lug this around with me all day. The struggle is real, it's happened to all of us. So back in the days of package delivery, purchasing super bulky merch wasn't a big deal. After all, whatever you bought could be delivered back to your hotel for you. But Disney hasn't brought back that service after the 2020 closures yet. So we gotta be the pack mules nowadays. Unless it's one of those limited time items that fly off the shelves real fast just as soon as they're stocked, it's normally okay for you to just wait and purchase those big items toward the end of the day. Plus, that gives you enough time to think about said item and decide if you really want it that badly after all, cause if it's not worth backtracking for, it's probably not worth buying in the first place. However, if you're afraid your coveted item will sell out before the end of the day, you can always rent a locker at the front of the park for around 10 to $15, depending on the size. That's where you can stow your big purchases for the time being, then at the end of the day, you can go back and pick them up. Or better yet, check the Shop Disney website before you make that souvenir purchase. Why? Because there's a good chance you can buy that same item online and have it delivered directly to your house. Not only that, but lots of times throughout the year, Shop Disney will have sales featured on their website, and that can help you save money on that must-have item. It can actually be cheaper online than in the park, and then you don't have to haul it home in your suitcase. Okay, don't be the person that gets in line for a meet and greet too late. I know your day is going to be filled to the brim with rides and shows and snacks, but if you're wanting to meet a particular character during your day, don't wait until the last minute. When it comes to meet and greets, timing is everything, especially for more popular character meet and greet locations like Mickey at Town Square and Magic Kingdom. That means if you wait in line closer to when the meet and greet is about to wrap up, you may not actually be able to get in line for it at all. Unlike the rides, cast members will often block off the lines early if they're starting to look rather long closer to closing time. This goes for characters who are meeting with guests outside too, not just the ones inside buildings. And since some characters stop meeting well before the park closes, like four or five or earlier, those lines may shut off even sooner than you realize. So if there's a character you really wanna meet, prioritize that meet and greet for earlier in your day or as close to its start time as possible. Better yet, some character meets are even listed as a lightning lane option. So if a character you wanna see is pushing a 60 plus minute wait, yep, it does happen, you might wanna use your Genie Plus purchase to bypass the main queue entirely. Whatever you decide to do, keep an eye on the My Disney Experience app so you know when those character meets start and end each day. Now here's a controversial point that could be bad advice for some, but vacation saving for others. Be careful how many table service restaurants you book in one day. I love a good table service restaurant during my time in the Disney parks. I do, but there comes a time when you can have too much of a good thing and booking 
three table service restaurants in a single day can be too much of a good thing. Let me give you a scenario. Let's say you're at Magic Kingdom and you start your day with breakfast at Crystal Palace. Great, you've just had a nice filling buffet. You did breakfast there, which means it's gonna be cheaper than lunch or dinner. You're gonna get to meet all those characters. And it took an hour out of your morning, but still got you ready for the rest of your park visit. And yet, a couple hours later, you've got a lunch reservation for Skipper Canteen that you've got to rush to make. Is it really time to eat again? You still may be full from breakfast by this time, and you might have only hit up one or two attractions before the call of the skippers demands you to eat more food. So now you've finished up your second meal of the day after another hour sitting down and eating, making you stuffed to the brim. Then you're not ready to get back in the heat, so you're ready for a nap, and forget about trying some of those popular Magic Kingdom snacks because you're too full to even think about a classic Dole Whip or a basket basket of Columbia Harbor House hush puppies. By the time dinner rolls around and you're due to return to your third and final reservation of the day over at Liberty Tree Tavern, the kids may be fed up with having to put everything on pause just to eat more food that they're not hungry for, and the prefix prices you're going to have to pay for all that all-you-care-to-enjoy food is going to end up not being worth it in the end, since your group is liable to munch on one or two things, but not nearly enough to make up for the price you just paid. So what could have been a fun Magic Kingdom day has turned into one where your family is grouchy and sluggish, you missed out on a lot of rides, you're so full that you're miserable, and you have to spend a couple hundred bucks for each meal that you really didn't need to spend in the end. See where I'm coming from? Booking one or two table service meals during the day is, is fine, but don't stick your nose up at the park's quick service, which can get the job done too without you having to spend a lot of time and money to make it happen and not having to eat quite so much food. Take it from someone who, when they're in Disney World, eats like 10 meals a day. It can be a lot and it can feel overwhelming and your body just can't handle it. Again, you might disagree with this, especially if your family is more about the experience of food above all else, but it's important to discuss these things with your group first before booking a whole lot of table service that may not end up being worth it. Okay, like I mentioned before, no Disney World trip is gonna be 100% flawless, literally none of them, but that doesn't mean you can't make it great just by being proactive and avoiding the easy missteps before and during your trip. Ready to get a head start on planning? Then don't forget to download our free digital planning worksheets over on disneyfoodblog.com slash disneyplans. It's a super fun thing to do with your family on the weekend or, you know, not with your family. That's, that's okay too. Keep checking back here with us, your DFB besties, for lots more tips and tricks to come. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.